In today's video, I'm going to build an automated solid sharpening machine. We need to start with a disk centering spindle. The best idea that came to mind was to dig through the scrap angle grinder box and hunt for the main center shaft. Despite some parts being missing or unusable, I was lucky enough to find the piece I needed. The main shaft with a locking thread and even a matching bearing. Oh, and there's even a spare grinding flange. Based off the outer diameter of the bearing, I drilled a hole of the same size in a 12mm piece of plywood. The hole wasn't drilled all the way through, because the bearing needs support. While I was at a drill press, I also drilled a few smaller, pre-measured and marred holes. The 32mm hole gave me the perfect tight fit. Before mounting the shaft, I added a 3D printed spacer to raise the disc surface to the needed height. I printed a few spacers with a 0.5mm increments in case I need to adjust the disc position for perfect alignment. Great, the shaft also fits perfectly with the finger press and sits exactly where I want it. At the first glance, it might look perfect, but on closer inspection, I found that the shaft held by only one bearing had a bit of play. This will translate to even larger play when I added the disc for sharpening. So the simplest solution was to add another bearing on the opposite side of the plywood. A spare bearing was pressed into a small piece of plywood with a drilled hole and fixed in perfect alignment. As always, in such situations, CA glue did the job well. And now the shaft play is gone. The whole base needs to slide back and forth, so it should be mounted on some rails. My first idea was to use short drawer slides. But when I found out how much play they had, I decided to look for a better option. After 10 minutes on Google, I found a solution. Linear rails. They are commonly used for high accuracy machines like CNC's, so they are perfect for my needs. The great features of the linear rails are due to the clever design, with the ball bearings rotating in loops on each side. As the rail moves inside, the balls rotate and travel along the looped circle inside the liner guide weight block, providing smooth and precise movement. With M3 balls through the drill holes, the liner rails were attached to the plywood. It is probably time to shorten the shaft to ensure enough clearance for the rail to reach the flat surface. Before securing the sliding bed to the jig base, I need to drill and tap M6 hole at the plywood end. I need to do this now, because there won't be enough clearance once the slider is attached to the base. To match M6 thread, I bent L-shaped hook from M6 threaded rod. I screwed a nut onto the hook and then threaded it into the slider. Once the desired position was reached, the hook was secured with a locking nut. I used 15mm plywood for the base. I slid the rails all the way to the left, removed the end stop caps and secured them with the small wood screws through the pre-drilled holes. That's why those last holes were made. They allow me to align and secure the rails through the plywood. Finally, the end caps need to be put back on to prevent the rails from coming off. It moves smoothly and effortlessly. Now let's focus on building an automated slider moving solution. This is a 12 volt brushed DC motor with a gear reduction. The gearbox provides a lot of torque and a slow speed considering the motor size. This isn't the first time I've used this electric motor. I used it when I built a wire harness wrapping machine. I'm a big fan of this setup. Motor, speed controller and a battery, because it is simple and effective. By the way, if you haven't seen that project, I highly recommend watching it. The wire harness wrapping machine works amazingly well and got a lot of attention on YouTube. I leave a link to that video in the description below. I made a motor mount from 15mm plywood. No complex design here, just the actual motor dimensions was used and drilled a centering hole for the shaft. Then I marked the outer dimensions and recessed the area for the motor. Three countersink holes on the other side allowed the motor to be positioned and secured with the M3 screws. With a good amount of CA glue, the motor was secured in place. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be using the same electronic setup as in my previous project. This is a simple PWM DC speed controller with in and out connections. 
To secure it in a convenient position and isolate it, I mounted it on 3D printed 8mm risers. I also 3D printed a mount for a 12V battery. A few drops of sea glue helped secure the mount. The battery was borrowed from my small Bosch 12V drill. With a satisfying click, the battery was secured in the holder. Connecting everything was a straightforward wiring job. A pair of wires goes from the battery to the in terminals and soldered wires on the motor side connect to the out terminals. No matter the complexity of your projects, custom made parts are often needed. If you don't have expensive equipment in your workshop, you can always seek the service externally, like from PCBWay. All you have to do is select the service, upload your file and you'll get the materials to choose from. Just with a few clicks you will get an instant quote with the pricing upfront. If you are working on projects like me, PCBWay offers a wide range of service that might be helpful. They provide high quality PCBs, CNC machining, laser cutting, injection molding and 3D printing from a variety of plastics and even metals. I've used their services several times in the past and had real great experiences. So check out their website in the description below to find out what parts they can make for you. Now I need to convert the rotational movement into sliding motion back and forth. I'll start by making an arm on the motor shaft. In this small plywood piece I drilled three holes, two on the flat surface and one on the edge. Two of the three holes were tapped to accept M6 bolts. I aligned and press fitted the arm on the motor shaft. Just from the sound you can tell how snug it is attached. I selected the shortest M6 grub screw from my hardware box and locked the shaft in place. The open threaded hole will be used to mount the second arm, which will be connected to the sliding bed. I'll make it from a 5mm PVC sheet. First I drilled a pair of holes with a Forstner bit. All four corners were rounded on the belt sander to give it a softer and lightweight look. Finally I press fitted a pair of bearings into the drilled holes. Using M6 hardware the mechanical parts were joined together. A quick test confirmed that everything works. Since I plan to mount wood cutting disc on the angle grinder system, I faced a small issue. The center hole on the angle grinder disc is 22.2 mm, while most wood cutting discs have 20 or 30 mm centering holes. They even come new with a 30 mm center hole and a metal adapter for 20 mm tools. So I had two options. Either use a part from a Bosch angle grinder and 3D printed a pair of adapters to convert the centering parts to 20 or 30 millimeters. But since I had a spare angle grinder flange and an access to a friend's mini metal lathe, I decided to slightly shave the outer diameter to fit 20 millimeter discs. The 3D printed option will work fine, but I always look for an excuse to use a metal lathe and gain some experience here. Now the disc with the 20mm hole fits perfectly. For the 30mm hole discs I'll use a metal washer that comes in the disc package. By the way, did you know that this flange could be made from two parts and it has a bearing inside? I was surprised because until now I thought all flanges were made from a single metal piece. Let's sandwich the wood cutting disc onto the shaft. First the flange, then a centering 30mm washer, the disc itself and the locking nut. The disc should spin and stop one tooth at a time. First I focused on the stopping action. I came up with a simple but clever solution. A micro switch with a roll lever. It converts mechanical action into an open or closed electric circuit. All I needed is that springy locking action. Ideally I like more force than what the native spring provides. So the small native spring I replaced with a bit stiffer and bigger one. Here's a comparison of the force before and after installing the stiffer spring. I pressed on the scales until I hear the switch clicking. As you can see I almost tripled the force. I used a piece of plywood to mount the switch flat to the correct height. A pair of large holes provided enough positioning and adjustability options during installation. Flat head wood screws with the washers secured the switch in place. The blade locking mechanism is done. Now let's make it spin. I made an L-shaped bracket from a 2mm aluminum piece. 
It has two holes and an oval slot in the middle. By adding three wood screws, a spring and a metal pin, I created this spring-loaded mechanism. As the sliding bed moves back and forth, the spring-loaded device will push the blade tooth by tooth. All that's left to find the right position to ensure it functions as intended. Here's a small teaser of how it should operate. When the slider moves forward, the disc tooth catches on the metal stopper, causing the disc to rotate just enough to skip over one tooth at the disc locking device. When the slider moves back, the stopper, thanks to the spring mechanism, slips and returns to its original position. Great! The concept works. I need to place and secure the angle grinder in the setup. To do that, I need to make a recess in the base. I used a cordless circular saw to cut a recess slightly wider than the angle grinder's disc thickness. This will allow the angle grinder disc to be in the optimal position. The angle grinder should be mounted on the raised platform. I made this platform from a few pieces of plywood. After gluing them together with a CA glue, I drilled 8 holes in the platform. The 4 holes in the corners were drilled straight, while the middle ones were drilled at an angle. This was necessary to make it easier to slide in a pair of hose clamps and adjust their position while securing the angle grinder. The clamps nicely strapped around the angle grinder housing, providing maximum rigidity and strength. Before mounting the angle grinder on the jig base, I made sure that the disc was perfectly square to the base. The 8mm holes drilled in the corners allowed for adjustment to precisely position the angle grinder disc relatively to the sharpening disc teeth. I adjusted it so that in its resting position the disc just barely touches the tooth of the blade. After securing all four screws, I double-checked by moving the sliding bed. As you can hear, the teeth barely scrapes the disc, providing the perfect clearance for this application. Let's mark the starting position for the sharpening, then turn on the angle grinder and start the jig. Yeah, just by the sound, I can tell that the angle grinder's disc is touching each tooth of the blade and sharpening it as it goes. And those sparks confirms it. I spun the blade a few full circles and stopped the jig. I hurried to remove the disc because I was eager to check the result. And yes, the teeth became very sharp. It is almost unpleasant to touch them because they dig into the skin. Alright, let's see how it cuts through the wood. The American walnut board, the thick block of paduk, and even 18mm plywood were cut through like butter. Each cut left a smooth and clean surface. I could not be happier and will call this build a great success. More importantly, this DIY sharpening tool was made using the most common workshop tools, a few small electronics and mechanical parts, and a good deal of creativity. What do you think? Can I call it well done? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching and until next time. Bye.